A principle of modern economy is the charging of interest, but for all of history, interest has been looked upon with a lot of skepticism. Bastiat, among many things, is remembered for his influential resolution of this question. It is important to remember that thinkers of his day charge that the revolution will always have to be recommenced so long as we occupy ourselves with consequences only, without having the logic or the courage to attack the principles itself. This principle is capital, false property, interest, and usury, which by the old regime is made to weigh upon labor. Ever since the aristocrats invented the incredible fiction that capital possessed the power of reproducing itself, the workers have been at the mercy of the idol. At the end of a year, will you find an additional crown in a bag of 100 shillings? At the end of 14 years, will your shillings have doubled in your bag? Will a work of industry or of skill produce another at the end of 14 years? These criticisms are scathing in charge that interest is a form of theft, and thus unjust, since money does not acquire value by itself, it is fundamentally draining wealth from people who borrow it and employ it in useful occupation. So to kind of understand this conflict, let's look at these two thinkers, Bastia and Proudhon, both sat in the French Assembly, which is their legislature of the day and work side by side on many issues. You see, both were philosophical libertarians, meaning that they believe that people have and ought to have free will. They're free in their actions and should be free to make choices. Bastiat, however, was a classical liberal and believed in mostly laissez-faire economics. Proudhon was a bit of a socialist and also a founder of the anarchist tradition. His system of economics and organization are known as mutualism, which for the sake of simplicity is kind of a compromise between communism and laissez-faire. The issue of charging interest was one of their main and most persistent disagreements. Both men agreed that this was the issue that prevented them from reaching a consensus on most issues. If you think the charging of interest is obviously just, then you should consider that Porky here has two million in savings and he earns 5% interest annually. What we can see right here is that he'll have a $100,000 yield. We must ask, where did this $100,000 come from? So if we consider for a second that everything that Porky consumes was made by someone laboring, it appears as if Porky is just leeching off the labor of workers. Workers had to produce all these things. Porky consumes 100000 dollars a year didn't come from nowhere it was produced by workers who produced it but bastiat answered this charge as thus both proton and bastiat recognize the legitimacy of trade if it is fair and voluntary there's nothing wrong with do this for me and i'll reciprocate with something for you we need to recognize the following that the value is not in the objects traded but the value you gain upon receiving the objects. The apples that Bastiat has and the chicken nuggets that Proudhon has have no value in themselves, but have only the value that Bastiat and Proudhon get out of them in their uses. When they trade, it is not because of the objects themselves have value, which makes the trade fair. It is because the uses that Bastiat and Proudhon get out of the objects make it a fair trade. This is a very crucial distinction that we have to understand. It is in the use that we get out of something, not the value in itself. So we also need to recognize that money is a tool we can use to simply calculate whether or not the use of something is worth being deprived of the use of another. The exchanges reduce the time that Bastiat with his apples needs to find Proudhon with his chicken nuggets to barter. We must remember that this exchange, no matter if we use money as a medium or not, is still connected to the idea of the free, voluntary, and fair exchange of trading apples for chicken nuggets. The question that arises 
is what makes this trade of apples for chicken nuggets a fair exchange? What is the correct amount of apples to chicken nuggets? Bastiat tends towards, well, anything that's voluntary. If I agree to make a trade, then it's obviously fair. But his critics did not share the sentiment. Regardless, Bastiat reasoned the following. We can easily recognize that if Bastiat offered his four quarters for Brutun's dollar, this would be a trade where both parties are exchanging something of equal value. This is beyond dispute. No one can say this is unfair. Four quarters, a dollar, it's the same thing. But if Brutun asked for another clause to be added to this transaction, it would render it balanced in his favor, and thus unfair to Bastiat. So if Brutun said to Bastiat, give me your four quarters and I'll give you a dollar in one year, it would be fair for Bastiat to respond, well, I am giving you these four quarters and I have to wait a year to receive my dollar. That's an additional service that requires some additional compensation in return because I'm being deprived of that dollar. Moving away from money, suppose now that Bastiat and Prudhoon come to a conclusion that it would be fair to trade a house for a boat, such that the trade was perfectly fair and just. Now, Bastiat then asked to alter the trade that he can keep and enjoy the boat for one more year. He promises to repair it so that it is in the same condition, but in the meantime, he will take the house. Now, Bastiat says, well, isn't this just the same as before with the money? Wouldn't the fact that Prudhoon, that you're now being denied the boat, require that Bastiat promise you additional compensation for the fact that he is going to keep the boat and he's going to keep the house and keep the boat for one more year before he gives it back to you? Should the service of lending a boat be gratuitous? Bastiat argues just as in the lending of a boat, the lending of money in the form of a loan, and the extra compensation we call interest, is a fair fact of lending or renting out a piece of property. It's all the same. Boats, money. Now, Bastiat draws us to another scenario where we have a farmer named Edward. He's dreaming of starting his own farm, but he needs to stockpile a bunch of food before he attempts to put in the work to get his farm started. He spends all that time he needs to spend all that time building a barn, plowing the field, fixing up the land in order to get a, a good farm so that he can, you know, develop a very productive industry. So he reasons that he has to save up a large sack of beans so he can eat those beans while he's doing the labor. Now this is going to take a long time. Through the act of sacrificing and saving over a long time, he comes into the ownership of this sack of beans. So now he is about to get started on building his farm. He's set aside this food so that he can realize his industry and his dream and be more productive. Now Edward's friend named Selena comes along and she sees that Edward has this big sack of beans and asks to borrow the beans because she's getting her education. She needs something to eat. So, how can we resolve who gets the beans and on what terms? In fact, while this appears to be such a complicated issue, it was resolved very quickly. In a year, Selena will return a sack of beans full so that Edward will still be able to use his sack of beans. She's returning the beans to him just as they were so that he could then use them for his enterprise. She will also give another quarter sack of beans. So extra beans she will be giving up. And this is to compensate Edward since he had to delay building his farm, which he could have used to become much more productive in this time. But it went to Selena becoming more productive. So from this scenario, Edward realizes three things. He can lend his sack of beans forever. He can accumulate savings and eventually retire. And he can lend his beans to people who can use them to be more productive. Alex makes daily food deliveries on foot to his customers. But he realizes with a bicycle, 
he'll be able to make many more deliveries and deliver food to his customers much faster. For this to work, he would have to make more money delivering with his bicycle than he currently makes, plus the cost of obtaining the bicycle. He sits down and calculates that it would be worth it, but it would take months and months of extreme dedication, savings, and austerity to realize his dream. Alex, now that he has saved for his bike, his friend Rohan comes along, and the following conversation takes place. Rohan, please lend me your bike so I can be more productive in my work. I will return it in one year, good as new. Alex says, what will you give me in return? Rohan says, nothing. A loan should be given out of goodwill and brotherhood. Your bike is naturally unproductive. Alex says, it is not brotherhood to sacrifice and save for a new bike and for someone else to enjoy my sacrifice. That is slavery. Rohan says, I said I would return it as good as new in a year's time. Alex responds, I made this bike for myself and for my enjoyment. If you borrow it for a year, you will gain the profit and I will be deprived of the efforts of my sacrifice and savings. So Bastiat calls upon us to reflect on the following facts. A person builds capital by sacrificing now for future benefit. A person lends out their capital because the returns are better than personally producing with it. A person borrows because the cost of borrowing are less than what they benefit by producing with it. So from these facts that we can observe, Bastiat calls upon additional reflections. The creation of capital, we can say, makes labor more productive and thus adds value. If the capital, if the only reason we would make capital is because we can benefit from it. And thus the creation of capital is something that adds value to our lives. And thus it makes people more productive and we benefit from it. We can also say that lending at interest does not harm the borrower. We can understand this by if the interest is too much, you are free to go without the capital. This is because the capital is something that is added to labor to make it more productive. It is not necessary for labor to generate value. It's something that we can add and increase our value. But it's not any harm, it's, it's only a benefit. And that capital is created because its creation is judged to make you better off. You make it because it will make you better off. Of course, we have to deal with the following objections. What about the people who take out loans and borrow because of desperation? Bastiat calls us to reflect upon the fact that the lender did not put them in this situation in reality. The loans can only help them deal with a bad situation. The loans can only benefit them. So thus the lender is actually helping them, regardless of the bad and desperate situation that they're in. Furthermore, if there was more sacks of beans and bicycles, then people who feel that the charges of interest are too high would be able to go elsewhere. Part of the problem that people face is the scarcity of capital. If we had more capital, then it would be cheaper for labor to borrow it and, and employ it in productive uses. Encouraging the accumulation of capital is one way that we could solve our relative scarcity of capital. But there's still the objection that money is different from a sack of beans or a bicycle. The socialist thinker Thoreau asked, will you find an additional crown in a bag of a hundred pounds? People would say that beans and bicycles are productive. They can do stuff that is directly useful for production. Money, if let's set, will not magically be productive. There's no way for money to multiply itself. However, Bastiat calls upon people to reflect on what we previously learned about the nature of trade that money is an intermediary for exchange. The value of the money is not in the money itself, but all the things you can obtain, since it is the universal medium of exchange. Money simply simplifies the lending process, just as it simplifies trade and exchange in general. 
Furthermore, Bastiat reminds us that the process of charging interest allows for the perpetual accumulation of capital. This allows for us to perpetually expand our productiveness. People have access to more resources and leisure. As we can see right here, you know, the development of massive amounts of industry and the growth of our economy to perpetually exponentially for the past few hundred years has been pushed by the fact that capital accumulates exponentially. We also need to remember that in the past, leisure was something that few enjoyed, and their enjoyment came from the direct and brutal theft by a ruling class. However, leisure is something that is very important. It helps, you know, the discovery of new industry, people like Nugent and aristocrats or scientists that create great discoveries. But we also need to remember that their leisure was funded by this direct and brutal theft of taking from people. What Bossier reminds us is that the act of saving and thus lending allows for people to accumulate resources. It's not harming anybody by saving. Our savings don't harm people. And lending, well, that helps people. So we're now able to get a return on our savings and thus have time for leisure and other activities while benefiting others. And this is the power of voluntary exchange, credit, and interest. This video is an adaptation of a famous work of political economy, Capital and Interest by Friedrich Bastiat. This is a very short but influential work in the history of economics. Bastiat wrote economics in a language that was and is still easy to understand. While some of the examples are outdated, as he wrote over 150 years ago, as he wrote over 150 years ago, his writings still prove timeless understanding of the basics of political economy. Links to his work and other information on Bastia will be in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.